Welcome to the video ministry of Salem Primitive Baptist Church, located in Graysville, Arkansas. I would like to thank you for viewing today and hope you are blessed in the Word. I would also like to invite you to come and worship with us in person. We have worship service every Sunday morning at 1030 and Bible study every Wednesday night at 630. Please like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to us on YouTube for the most current updates. You can find links to these and more information about us on our website at www.salempbchurch.com. Thank you again, and may you be blessed in the knowledge of our God and Father. If you have your Bible with you this morning, I urge you to open to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 is where I'd like to uh, pick back up this morning. As we have been for some time, been looking at uh, this particular passage of Scripture and seeing how Paul is transitioning into the work of the church. I uh, remind you again, in the previous three chapters, he has been telling us of the work of God in the lives of his people. And now in the fourth chapter, he's beginning to transition into how we're supposed to respond to that knowledge and understanding. I... I Hope that we know, and this kind of goes into what I have on my mind this morning, that we don't need the book of Ephesians to tell us what God has done. It's done. God works independently from it. God did not need Ephesians chapter 1 in order to save us. It's not because Ephesians chapter 1 that God chose us before the foundation of the world. And saved us through the work of his son on the cross. Ephesians chapter 1 is written because that work is done. And it's written there for us to be able to understand those truths. And I hope you understand the difference between that work that was done by him. And the work that is done in and by us to understand that. And to apply that in our lives. Because that's really what Paul is trying to get across in the beginning of this fourth chapter, as he begins to tell us of how all-inclusive the Christian life is supposed to be. That's probably one of the things that every one of God's children needs to understand the most. Christianity is meant to be all-inclusive. It's not a weekend getaway. It's not just a place to rest and sleep. And you got to deal with the food and everything else yourself. It's meant to be all-inclusive. It's supposed to involve your life. It's supposed to involve your thoughts. It's supposed to involve your conversation, both verbally and actionally. Christianity is meant to be all-inclusive for the child of God. Because our salvation was all-inclusive with God. He chose it. He planned it out. He saw to it that it was done. He was even willing to give up his only begotten son in order to do so. He was willing to pour out his wrath upon him to save it from being poured out upon us. He quickened him from the dead. He placed him at his right hand. And he is giving, if we can wrap our head around this, he is giving 100% of his energy, 100% of his power for us. That is amazing. God is all-inclusive in our salvation, and we should in return be all-inclusive in our reaction 
to that salvation. And that is what Paul is trying to get across here as he goes into this fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. And I encourage you to read with me once again, Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 8. Skipping the parenthetical thought again. It says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And I'll stop there once again today. And I know there's probably at least a, at least one of you out there that's thinking, now, brother, you said last week was the last time we were going to read that section of Scripture. Well, you'll have to take that up with the Lord. It, it amazes me. It shouldn't amaze me on some levels, but it amazes me how much Scripture can just continually open and open and open, and it just it is truly an inexhaustible depth of richness of what God can bring out. That shouldn't surprise me, but I'm glad that it does. So I do want to look at this once again, not to go through each one of the gifts again. We're not starting over. But I do want to, as we press forward, look at this once more and bring out what these gifts are for. We've looked at each one of these gifts over the last several weeks, been looking at each one of these in depth and in detail, and I, I trust that you understand them. I trust that you um, believe in them and know what they are. I remind you just very quickly again, I want you to see these gifts because we're going to see them work together as we look at Scripture this morning. We're going to see the gifts of the apostleship, which is our foundation. Now, I told you all this again, and I'm really going to try hard not to re-preach everything, but I told you all before that he is... Christ is our bedrock foundation. But the apostles are those that began the New Testament church. They are the ones that established the truth. They are the ones that gave us directly from God the things that we are supposed to understand. And that is the truth that we are supposed to be the pillar and ground of, that we are supposed to stand firm in as Ephesians chapter 4 is going to bear out for us. The apostles being our foundation... The prophets being given to us to tell us both what God has done and what is coming for us. It, isn't it good to know there's a goal, to know that there's something coming that we can all unify if we all understand that there's one unifying promised end to look to? We're not trying to work out an end. We're not trying to do what we can to work out what's going to come for us. We're told by the prophets, we're told by those that God used both in Old Testament and New that there's a guaranteed end for his people and we can unify around that because God gave us these apostles even in the New Testament church. Y'all know what that guaranteed end is, right? Heaven and immortal glory is your home. It not not maybe, not it might be, not it should be. Heaven is the guaranteed home for every one of God's people without the loss of a single one. What a glorious truth. The apostles being our foundation, the prophets being given to us to promise that end to be established by more than two or three witnesses promising that guaranteed end, and the evangelists given to us so that we can remember it's not about us. Well, praise God, God saved me. I'm taken care of, and I know all of God's people are taken care of, so I don't have to do anything. No, God told us and gave us evangelists for us to realize it cannot and it should not stop with us. That knowledge, that joy that we have this morning in gathering together, that joy that we have in knowing that there's a guaranteed end for every one of God's children, the evangelists are given to us for us to realize it's not supposed to stop with us. It's not supposed to stop with me. I'm supposed to care about others. This spirit of evangelism is that yearning and that desire to share the truth of God 
with those others. That's why he gave us evangelists for us to realize it's not about just our little family. It's not just, it's not like Israel. Well, my kids are Israel, so I'll make sure they know. Well, their kids are Israel, so I'll make sure they know. No, the spirit of evangelism is God's got a people everywhere and they need to know and we should love them enough to make sure that they know. That's the spirit of evangelism. And then he gave us the pastors and teachers, pastors which are teachers, to keep us, to feed us, to provide for us until that promised end comes. You see how all of these gifts come together for the work of the ministry. We can see how this is uh, used in the church. We are still today standing on the work of the apostles. We're still today standing on the, the promises of those prophets. Salem Primitive Baptist Church here in Graysville, Arkansas is still standing on the work of the evangelist that brought it here. And we're depending on pastors and teachers to continue that work along with the congregation to keep that church here until he comes. Because that is the goal. Well, we see that Christ was amazing in giving us these gifts. And he, you know, God never gives us anything just for the sake of giving it to us. God gives us things for a reason. God has given you regeneration for a reason. He has given you the Spirit for a reason. And Christ gave these gifts to the church for a reason, for us to use and to exercise these. And that is found again in the 12th verse. And that's what I want to really spend our time on this morning and looking at is this 12th verse. He gave us all of these gifts for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And I know over the last few weeks, I've touched on these things a few times, just uh, uh, kind of lightly salted them for us to just have in our, our thoughts. But I want to really spend some time looking at these for us to understand the work of the church, to understand the role of the church. I don't understand the church has a role. It plays a part. God did not give us the church just for us to have a, a group of people to come together. It's got a role. It's got a purpose. If you would look with me in the book of Acts chapter 2. And I do encourage you to be in prayer this morning. Because even as I speak, the directions are scattering more and more. So, y'all be in prayer. Acts chapter 2. We see this from the very beginning of the church. Starting in verse 46 says, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That's the thought that wasn't even on my mind until this morning. And that's the thought that really needs to be bared out. Here in the book of Ephesians. God added to the church daily. Such as should be saved. That's an amazing statement. Now. I hope that I don't have to go into great detail of what that does not mean. Being a good old Baptist, you know I'm going to tell you. But I'm not going to go into great detail. Uh, I've been convicted over the last, for quite a while now, of the need of the ministry. And I've talked with other elders in the ministry, my dad and several others, 
of us within the primitive Baptist, we need to stop apologizing for what Scripture says. We need, we need to stop trying to defend ourselves before we just simply tell the truth. So I'm not going to go into great detail. I hope that I have established with you, and I hope that you're well enough established in the church and in God's truth to understand what this verse does not mean. God did not add to the church those that needed to be quickened into life. God did not add to the church the role of the church is not contrary to the vast majority, and I'm not throwing stones, we've got our problems too, but the role of the church is not making children of God. The role of the church is not putting feet into heaven. Y'all know God knows that? You know God inspired this word to be written. So obviously, if by God's word, we're not making children of God, then obviously, when it says God added to the church daily such as should be saved, he's not talking about eternally saving people. Okay? So there's as much a disclaimer as you're going to get. If you need more than that, ask me afterwards. And I do encourage you to ask. But you cannot escape that God added to the church, not that those that were saved, not those that had been saved, not those that were saved, not those that are saved. He added to the church those that should be saved. And he added them to the church. Y'all know God doesn't do anything on accident. Y'all know God doesn't do anything just, we've talked about this already this morning, God doesn't do anything just for the sake of doing it. There is a place, there is an establishment, there is a role found on this world that is made, that is left here, that is given to us for the purpose of saving God's children. I know that. But if Scripture tells us that, we can't escape that. I hope that in our understanding, in not needing the disclaimer of what it doesn't mean, I hope that means that we're willing to accept what it does mean. God gave to the church people that needed saving. We must understand, if we ever hope, if y'all understand what a hope is, right? It, it's not a wish. It is an expected truth. It is something that you were expecting because of known knowledge, known promised understanding. I can tell you, when you go to work, you expect a paycheck on Friday because you worked all week and you have an earnest hope that that paycheck is not only going to be there, it's not going to bounce when you put it in the, in the bank. You have a hope for that. That's what a hope is. The lottery is nothing more than a wish, and it's a waste of money on top of that. That's a wish. Oh, I wished I'd win this. I tell you, I don't have any hope in it because I never bought a ticket. Can't win it if you don't buy one. Guaranteed. <laughs> Since we're already snickering, you know there's one guaranteed way to not get somebody to come to church. Don't ask them. A hope is an expectation. If we hope to do this thing called church right, we kind of have to know what it is. We kind of have to know that understanding. We kind of have to know what church means. We need to know what the church is here for. We need to understand why it is that Christ left it here. We need to understand what the role and expectation that he has for the church. I started reading a book this last week, and there, there's a quote that's in it at the very beginning, and it just kind of flies in the face of kind of the spirit 
that we tend to have sometimes when it comes to election and God's uh, choosing us. God's choosing us as much as that's an awesome thing and something to celebrate. I mean, <laughs> praise God, he chose me. So, but really, much more, it should absolutely terrify us that God chose me to do something. Because he has earnest expectations. He knows what you can do. He knows when you're trying to do it. He knows when you're not trying to do it. If God chose you, there's no tricking the boss. There's no seeing him walk across the floor and then hurry up and pick a wrench up and act like you're doing something. It should actually terrify us that God has chosen us to do something. Because we owe just the same amount of diligence back to him as he gave to us. God has a role for the church. And you can see it in the fact that it is promised, it's, it's stated here that God added, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. God's people need saving. Brothers and sisters, I can tell you, I'm, I, I hope that the Lord has placed me here as pastor of the Salem Primitive Baptist Church. I hope that he has earnestly called me to preach. I can tell you, that doesn't make me some super Christian. I can tell you, I daily need salvation. I daily need saved from myself. I need saved from my wicked thoughts. I need saved from my wicked tendencies. I need saved from my doubts sometimes. I'm speaking for myself, and I hope you're doing the same thing. In our understanding, do we need saved? Y'all are the ones that are here. How much more do the ones out there need saved? God added to the church daily such as should be saved. And it is the church's role to do that saving. That is what Paul is talking about there in Ephesians chapter 4 when he says that Christ gave gifts unto men. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. You could replace that perfecting with the saving of the saints. Now that would scare the liver out of some old Baptist to save from the pulpit. But it shouldn't. If we as the church don't understand what we're here for, we can't do the things that God has placed us to do. Understand that these gifts were given to the church and no child of God is complete without the proper use of them and no church is complete without properly using them. It works on both sides. So our role is not to create children of God. God has done that perfectly. Here's the blessed thing about God calling you to do something. God's not going to call you to do anything that you're not capable of doing and that he's not going to provide the needed resources for you to do it. He's not going to do it. You're not going to find a single time in Scripture ever that he calls somebody to do something and says, you figure out how to get it done. He never said, Moses, I want you to go into Egypt and I want you to figure out how to get the people out. Moses tried that and how did it work out for him? He killed one Egyptian and ran away scared because somebody looked at him, what are you going to kill me too? And he ran away scared. God didn't tell Moses to go in there and figure out how to get it done. He said, Moses, go in and through you, I will bring my people out. I will give you the words. I will give you the strength. I will give you the direction. I will give you everything that you need in order to bring my people out of their bondage. God does not call us to do anything that he does not provide everything that we need in order to get it done. And God has given us perfectly born again children of God. 
The perfecting of the saints is not that we are going to make them perfect. It is not that those saints are lacking anything. They are saints. They are perfectly born again. They have ears to hear. They have eyes to see. They have will to do. They have strength to take action. They have a mind that can understand God. They have everything that they need. We don't have to do any of that. It's not my role to give them ears to hear. It's not my role to give them eyes to see. It's not my role to give them a will to follow. It's not my role to give them a strength to work for God. But we have a role. God has given us perfectly born-again children of God to work with. I preach knowing that God has given me a congregation of perfectly born-again children of God that are able to hear. And praise God, I don't have to convince y'all to hear. Praise God, y'all aren't depending on my strength to have strength to do. That you're not depending on my will to have will to do. Because we'd be a, a, a lousy bunch if y'all were dependent on mine. But God has given us perfectly born-again children of God to work with. And we don't have to do that. We've got the perfect source material to work with. It's already provided. What we do, what we're called on to do, what they were doing here at the start of the first century, very first, very beginning of the New Testament church, is they were making disciples. From sonship to discipleship. And the church plays a major ultimate role in that transition. Taking children of God and making them disciples of God. There is a huge difference. Every true disciple of God is a child of God. But not every child of God is a disciple of God. That takes work. Paul refers this work as birth. He travails with this. Look with me in Galatians chapter 4. Paul refers to this work as childbearing. And this is some of that confusing language that makes us want to run away from it. Because others misteach Galatians chapter 4, we fail to teach it hard enough. Now, my, I'm not saying that we've never preached it. I'm not saying I've never heard this section of Scripture preached, because I have. But we spend so much time saying what it's not, that we don't spend enough time to make people understand what it is. Here in Galatians chapter 4, Paul is uh, speaking much of the same thing. I want to begin verse 18. It says, But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. That'd be a good thing for us to learn. And not only when I am present with you. I'll leave the rabbits alone. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. My little children, that I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Much of Christianity applies that to the role of the church and the role of the minister is to preach with everything they've got in them, with every bit of unction that they have, and to work diligently and work tirelessly till those are born again and Christ be brought into them. Is that what Paul is saying? We know that preaching does not born people again. So that's not what he is saying. We know that. 
So what is Paul saying? Because this is the heart of Paul. And y'all remember, he's one of those pastors that was also used as a prophet and also used as an evangelist and also used as a pastor. And you see him using all of that work together in the forming and the keeping of these churches that he travailed, that he worked diligently. He said, I have made all things unto all men so that I might save some. He worked diligently knowing that he is not borning children again. He is not inviting Christ into the hearts of these people. But he says, I worked and I travailed diligently until Christ was formed in you. This is not the inviting of Christ into them. This is not Christ coming into those children of God. This is more like the focusing of a picture. This is taking those children of God and working with them until they understand that that desire for comfort, that desire for peace, that desire for contentment is not found in money. That's a major scale over the eyes of a born-again child of God that is still in the world. They have a desire for comfort and they have a desire for peace and they think that money is going to take care of that. You can look in the book of Ecclesiastes and you can find where Solomon tried money. He tried women. He tried drugs. He tried alcohol. He tried fornication. He tried everything he could. He tried just being the hardest worker on the face of God's green earth. He had that desire in him. He tried to fill it with everything until he realized what he was desiring was God. That's what Paul is talking about here when he says, I travailed with you as if I born you again until Christ was formed in you. That's not him making children of God. It's him bringing Christ into focus for the child of God. It's him taking that blurred image that's inside of them, that that spirit that's in them that's crying out, Abba, Father, that's looking and yearning, and that born-again spirit that's in them that, that wants God but just doesn't understand what it is that it's after. And any of you ever had to work with little kids? And just having to teach them how to walk? Does that, does that happen easily? You got to work with them for a while, don't you? Did you give them the muscles to do that? Or did you train them how to use those muscles until they could do that? To teach a child to speak. Did you give them the vocal cords or did you train them to use those vocal cords to form the words, mama, and daddy. And then to grow those words into full-on sentences and conversation. Which one was it? Did that come easy? Did they ever say stuff you wish they hadn't? It's funny how you didn't have to teach them to do that, right? This is what Paul is talking about. This is the role of the church. This is all of those gifts coming together in the church for the work that is meant for it, for the perfecting and the unifying of those children of God is to work with them and to teach them to use, to train those spiritual eyes that God has given them to not see the things of the world, to train, to pluck out those fleshly eyes and cast them into the fire because they offend you and they make you sin, to work and diligently work with them until they pluck those naturalize out and train their eyes to look to God and to see those things that are presented by him into their lives and to train their ears to stop being drug away by the whispered words of the world and listen to that spirit that's inside of them crying out, Abba, Father, to train those ears and to fine tune those ears to understand what it is that they're hearing inside of them. You know you can hear from God not just when you're doing wrong saying stop that, well, we're thankful for a conscience that 
we get that with God, said, stop that. Do you know you can hear from him not only just then? You can hear from God saying, good job, son. You can hear that spirit crying out, Abba, Father. You can hear those words coming back from that, that sermon that was three weeks ago that you couldn't remember at all, and then something happens and it clicks on, and you're like, you know, the... The pastor preached on that just last a couple of weeks ago, and I was able to use it today. That's the bringing together of those gifts in the church to fine tune and to tweak and to, to pull away the scales until the true Jesus Christ is formed inside of the mind and the heart of that child of God. Not saying that there's a false. Christ in him. I hope y'all understand. I really don't want to waste my time explaining myself. I hope you understand and get what I'm saying until they understand that true Christ. There are so many of God's children out there. Again, I'm not throwing stones. Y'all please understand. But there are so many of God's children out there in the world that have a Christ formed in them that is limp-wristed and can't save a single one of his people unless they do something. That's not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. Until they have the true Jesus Christ formed in them that loved them before they ever existed and was willing to die for them when they hated him. He was willing to die for them. He didn't ask for anything. He didn't knock on your heart and ask your permission to do anything. But I can tell you, he's in there saying, see me. Listen to me. Follow me. And it's the church's role to fine-tune those ears and those eyes and to work that strength and to teach them how to use those muscles in their legs until they walk, until they stand firm. It is the church's role to mother them. What a glory it is for someone to come into the church and to see that truth for the first time. And that doesn't happen quickly or easily, does it? It's a travail. It comes with pain. They get angry. They get frustrated. They don't understand. It hurts. It's a travail. It takes time. We can't expect the role of the church to be quick and easy. It takes time. This is a travail in love. He says, I've worked diligently with you. This is why in the book of Re Revelation that the New Jerusalem, which I told y'all is the New Testament church, which is the church that we are experiencing today, it's why New Jerusalem is called the mother of us all. It's not because the church is making children of God. It's because the church is here for the role of rearing children. Now, am I showing my age and saying it, rearing children? Y'all know what rearing children means. It's raising kids. Not having kids, raising them. There's a huge difference, and I'm not just talking about borning kids. I'm telling you, there are so many in the world today that they just have kids. They don't raise kids. I mean, the church is not here just to have children of God here. The church is here to raise children of God. And that is a work. It is a work of love. It is not a work of anger. I'm not hollering this morning because I'm angry. I hope y'all know that. But raising children, not just allowing them to live in your house and make sure they've got food on the table and clothes on their back and Lord help them from there because I've, I've raised up kids. No, I mean raising children. Teaching them in love that there is a right and a wrong way to act. I can tell you raising children is a lost act in the world today. The world has tricked us and taught us that the kids are supposed to raise the parents instead of the parents raise the kids. Oh, I just have to make sure they have everything they ask for. Hogwash, you do not. Does God give you everything you ask for? Are you better than him? 
then you don't owe your kids everything they ask for. They're going to ask foolishly, and you need to be grown up enough to say no. Is that too harsh? I tell you, raising kids is a lost art on today's world, and it has directly come from the church forgetting to raise kids. The church has forgotten how to raise children. And the world has forgotten to raise children because of it. Raising children is to nurture them, to train them up, to teach them lovingly, to correct them when they're wrong, to teach them morality. I can tell you, I am sick to death of the world telling us that we can't teach morality. How dare you try to push down on me what's right and wrong? Because I've been taught what's right is wrong. And there is right, and there is wrong. Because there is right, there is wrong. If you tell me that there is, if the world is willing to admit there is anyone good, does the world say that anybody is good? They do. If the world is to tell us that there is even one person good, then by that, there is wrong. There is not right. Well, we should just accept everything. Then you just admitted that person's not good. That person's just who they are. And what difference does it make if they're good or not? There is good. There is evil. There is right. There is wrong. There is a right way to worship God. There is a wrong way to worship God. There is a right way to think about God. And there is a wrong way to think about God. And whose role is it to teach that? It is the church. The church is called the mother of us all in Scripture because it is the church's role to raise children. To grow them up. That, that, there's... The extension of that. Parents, did you teach your children to do right from wrong, expecting them to stay an infant their entire life? Or did you teach them right from wrong, expecting them to grow up and act like that? And I don't want to be too harsh, but the church is not teaching and God is not giving us ministers and God is not giving us pastors to teach us right from wrong for us to spend 52 years in the church and still not be able to tell you what the church believes. You're expected to grow in the church. You're expected to learn. You're expected to grow up to be that next generation that's teaching the next generation. You're expected to mature we're expected to do so. God has lovingly given us perfect vessels to work with. I know they're cracked. I know they got problems. I know they got scars. I know they got issues. And I know when you go fishing, you wind up smelling like fish. That's okay. Because the fishy smell washes off. But God has nonetheless given us perfect vessels to work with. The role of the church in applying these perfectly is, as Paul is saying here, to born them until Christ be formed in them. We can see this working more uh, directly in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We can see all of these gifts working together to this very end in a little bit more detail when he's writing to the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> and you see that mothering going on again in the first verse. It says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. 
Is that not a loving mother? That knows when that child is ready for the, the better food, the, for the stronger meat, the harder to understand? You see that loving mother again. I've dealt with you as babes. I have travailed with you as babes in Christ, and I have gave you the, the easy, the, the ground, that foundational, that easy-to-understand doctrine. I, I have given you Ephesians 1 and 2, that milk of the Word, that God is God. God does love you. God has chosen you. I have given you that easy Word. I have seen when you were not ready for spiritual meat, those harder things. The child first needs to be taught how to crawl before you can teach it to walk, doesn't it? That's a, that's a growth in that learning and that understanding. And the child comes out needing the milk of the word and it's eventually able to start getting the, the mushy foods. The disgusting phase, in my opinion. Then they can start eating the solid food as they get more mature and they get their their bodies are more ready for it right you see that i'm telling you the the maternal instincts of the church cannot be over exaggerated as they're found here in scripture that that maternal loving motherhood of the church just cannot be overstated and i hope that you understand it where i've worked with you with milk and here you're still not ready to to deal with it. Paul is raising children here. He is scolding them. Sometimes the ministry needs to scold us a little bit. Sometimes it needs that smooth, easy milk. And the minister needs to understand both sides. Sometimes the church has had a little too much of the hard stuff. Let's have some smooth for a little bit. But the church has to be willing to accept both the smooth and the scold. The child has to be willing to accept the chastisement the same. He says, you should by now be mature. And y'all thought I was just making that up, that we're expected to mature in the church. No, Paul says it. You should now, by now, be mature enough to be able to handle the the hard things be able to handle the meat of the word, but you're not there yet. You're still dragging behind. You need to catch up. You need to come on with it now. You need to pick up. I should be able to, by now, be able to send you a more in-depth epistle than this. But you're not there yet. And again, the loving mother kicks in. You're not there yet. So I'm going to work with you again. But now are ye still yet carnal? For ye are yet carnal, for where is there is among you envying and strife and divisions. Are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that gave, giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. He's talking to the church here, again, as that loving mother saying, you should be able to accept the harder things, but you're not there yet. So let me go back to the milk of the word. You know who God is? God is the one that saved you. God is the one that gives the increase. God is the one that we should focus on. God is the all in all. The preachers, they're just preachers. They're just the ones that teach you how to use what God has given you. They are not God. God is God. That is as much milk of the word as you can get. That is the most fundamental, strengthening thing that we can depend on. God is God and there is none else. I'm not making the church God by preaching this. I'm reminding you who God is by preaching this. He gives them the milk of the word again. God is God and he gives the increase. 
the preachers. It does not matter if it's me, if it's Brother Harold Stumball, if it's Brother Gary Harvey, it's Brother Carl Staten, Brother Dan Sammons. It does not matter who it is. Whatever your favorite preacher may be, and we've all got one, it does not matter who he is. The ministry is one. They've got one role. And it's not to make you a child of God. It's not to strengthen you. It's not to give you eyes. It's not to give you ears. It's just to train. I came along, Paul says, I came along as the apostle and the evangelist and I planted. Apollos came behind me as pastor and he watered and he fed and he provided for you. This is just the gifts that God gave us working together for your unison. And it never ceases to amaze how much we will absolutely pervert what God gives us. Every good thing that God has given us, man has found some way of twisting it, perverting it, and making an arguing point. And it'll never stop. He said, you're just seeing God's work. You're just seeing Ephesians 4 come about here. You see all of the gifts given to the church, and you've made it an arguing point saying, no, I can tell you, Paul is the one that baptized me. Well, Apollos is the one that's here with us now, and he's the one that took care of me. He says, stop that. Get that out of your mind. Here's a little bit of polishing that we need to give. Till Christ be formed in you. Christ is the focus. Get those preachers out of the way. It's God that gives the increase. See, we see again those gifts working together in the self-same way. For the church, this is a congregation coming together and being taught and, and peeled back until they see, the, till they come in unity of the Spirit and unity of the knowledge and the faith. It is not the church's role to make cookie-cutter Christians. Praise God y'all are not like me. My wife would say amen to that. That's why she snickered. Caught her doing it. Praise God y'all are not like me. Again, we'd be a lousy sot if, uh, but if we were all like me. Wouldn't get nothing done. The church's role is not about making cookie-cutter Christians. The church's role is, though, making a unified knowledge, making a unified faith, making a unified goal, bringing us together in one purpose. Do we all believe in the same God? Do we all believe the same things about that God? Do we understand the same truths of God? I can tell you the church is not in unison until the people begin to repent and the people begin to forsake their idols. And we can all shake our heads and nod and say amen. We all believe in the same God. But if anybody has an idol in their life, the church is not yet in unison. If there's somebody in the church that is still holding money as their idol or their job as their idol or their spouse as their idol or their self-image as their idol or, or what they identify as as their idol and that's their focus, then the church will never come into true unity. And it is the church's role to edify one another until we all come into one mind of the true God until there is one God that this church worships. There is one God that this church studies. There is one God that this church stands for. It's not about being cookie cutter Christians, but it is about absolutely being steadfast, unmovable, unyielding, that there is indeed a God of the Bible. And it is up to us to know him. And to understand how he works. To understand how he thinks. And we don't get to change him and twist him according to our faults. 
The world wants to just make God just whatever we want him to be. If some of you want him to be a, an old man sitting in a rocking chair handing out Werther's originals, well, if that's your image of God, you just hold on to that and you worship God. And, and if you see God as this glowing spirit, then you just hold on to that image of God. No, there's one God. And he is definable. We can't fully understand him, but he is definable. There is one God. There's one goal. And it is the perfecting of the saints, the unity of the faith and the knowledge. Do we all have faith in the same God? And we might not have the same amount in our use of it, but do we all have the same faith in the same God at the same time? Do we all come together seeking this one God? Do we all come together knowing that without that one God's involvement, there will be no increase? Do we all understand the gifts that God has given us? This is what the church is about. It's about making us of one mind when it comes to God. Everything else in life just reflects what we think about him. And as we understand him better, it will affect everything else in our lives more because you start finding he is all-encompassing of everything in our life. And he stops being the hub of our wheel and he becomes the wheel. That's the goal of the church. We do not make children of God. But we absolutely need to be in the business of making disciples. And it's not about making disciples like me. It's about making disciples like Christ. Go ahead and read the next couple of verses in Ephesians chapter 4. I don't have the time. We're out of time and I'm not going to rush the point. So y'all go read the next couple of verses. It's not about making disciples according to me. It's not about making disciples according to PB. It's not according to making disciples according to KJV. It's about making disciples according to him. And that'll only happen with the use and the submission to those gifts. I thank you. And God bless. I will sing the wondrous story of the cross. Thank you again for joining us at Salem Primitive Baptist Church. I pray that the Word of God may brightly shine in your lives. If you would like to contact us or would like to download a copy of today's message, please go to www.salempbchurch.com. God bless you all. Who died for me? Sing His with the saints in glory. The saints in glory. Gather by. Gather by. Crystal sea, crystal sea.